Now, the title in the program talks about changing boundaries in the 21st century. The 20th century witnessed significant border changes, changes in physical borders. The 21st century seemed rather calm, especially in the first decade in, the, in that regard. Now, thinking about this apparent calmness, at least until the last couple of years, I th thought, thought about the first time I came to Budapest. That was in 1987. That's before 1989. I was with my high school group at the time. We were on our way to Poland on a bus, driving through what was then the Eastern Bloc. This morning I went for a longish walk just to see the bridge that, that was the only thing that I could remember from that trip. And that walk allowed me to reflect on borders, visible borders and invisible borders. And it's the latter that I'm going to talk mostly about, not just the visible ones, but also the invisible ones. At the time, that's 1987, I'd crossed several visible borders on the way to coming here, borders of nation states. But I also crossed another invisible border into then what was called the Eastern Bloc. That was a border in our mind. It was still a world of na nation states, but that was also a border in our mind. These so-called Eastern Bloc countries were to the west of Turkey and Greece, but they were still nevertheless considered as Eastern. Greece and Turkey were called Southeast perhaps, which reminds you of the politics of east-west boundary drawing. This time, I came yesterday evening. I flew through Germany. There was a PhD defense, successfully defended, if there are PhD students amongst you. I came through Stuttgart airport. And since it's an intra-EU flight, I crossed physical borders which are not politically relevant any longer. And I did not go through passport control. But I crossed an invisible border nevertheless, a new member. Sometimes you experience these invisible borders when you witness debates on new EU members in the previously older EU member states. If you follow the debates that are going on in the UK, for instance, about who, has, who can move and who can't move, what kind of rights should new member state citizens should be allowed? Or you experience it, which is what happened to me last month. I was visiting, let's not name it, another EU country, and I had a Schengen visa from Poland on my passport. The border um, officer of this unnamed EU member country looked at my visa and said, it's from Poland, as if I had done something wrong. Clearly, there is an invisible border in uh, on his mind as to who is more meticulous when giving out visas as opposed to those who are not so meticulous. There is an invisible border there, new members versus more established members. I said, what can you do? I went to a conference in Poland. That's how I got my visa. He was not convinced, but he did not have any right to um, stop me there. I had, to, I had a right to cross the visible border. I could not cross the invisible one on his mind. So the borders that are physical, which have been removed inside the European Union, and there are borders that are invisible, which are still with us, which are yet to be removed. This issue of invisible border is important when you're discussing more generally about uh, discussing issues of human rights and minority rights. The issue of uh, invisible borders also reminded me something that I read um, a couple of years ago. This is someone from the former German Democratic Republic, 
after the unification of Germany, a colleague of mine was, went to Germany to do research on citizens, what they thought about the unification. I'm talking about former East Germans and talking, talking to former East Germans, talking to former West Germans, so to speak. This, former, uh, this person from the German Democratic Republic said, I became East German after the unification. I'll say this again. I became East German after the unification. Previously, I was just German. It's after the unification when we began to be treated as Easterners that I realized that I was East German. Borders come down, borders go up. There are visible borders that may be coming down, but they, there may be invisible borders that are coming up. I'm talking mostly about invisible borders today. So that was an introduction to my introduction. I wanted to say more about visibility, invisibility of borders because I wanted to clarify what I'm starting with. The invisible so-called borders have very visible effects, as we will see. You may actually say even the visible borders are borders on our minds. There's a border at the airport, for instance. That's a national border at the airport, which is in the midst of a city. On the one side is the national territory. You can only pass through passport control. On the other side, you have Edward Snowden territory. People who can't pass through passport control stay there. That's in the middle of the capital or whatever city. But sometimes, interestingly, borders at the airport are more real in physical terms than physical borders over there, your border with another country, which may not be as well protected. So, which is to say, I acknowledge the artificial draw dividing line between visible versus invisible borders. Borders that are physical, borders that are on our mind. I recognize the artificiality, but I'm nevertheless going to talk mostly about those borders on our mind, because this is what I think has implications for what we are interested in. Now, I'll start by saying something about borders in international relations. Some of you have may have background in international relations. I will then talk about how this is a particular approach to borders that's shared by geopolitics. Then I will bring in the insights of critical perspectives on geopolitics and say something about how it allows us to think differently about borders in physical terms, but also in terms of the borders on our minds. And for, um, as an empirical illustration, I'll look at EU Mediterranean relations and see how this all works out with reference to a case when thinking about borders in Europe or borders of Europe, both. In international relations, as I said, if you have IR background, you would be very familiar with this. We take boundaries for granted. We do not always ask how boundaries came about. Sometimes we have a historical perspective, but we don't necessarily question boundaries. We look at the drawing of boundaries. The state system is organized around state boundaries, the so-called Westphalian state system. Um, those who have a more historical sociology interest would look at how international systems operated with different notions of boundaries in the past. We also hear that some societies, which are our contemporaries, may have different notions of boundaries. Some may be more porous than others. But in IR, we take boundaries for granted. We don't necessarily question the notion of boundary and how boundaries operate. And critical perspectives remind us that it's through boundaries that we understand international relations. It's through boundary practices that we understand international relations. Uh, some of you may be familiar with RBJ Walker's work, Rob Walker's work. He reminded writing in the early 1990s that international relations rests on the inside-outside boundary. Those who are in the boundary, those who are outside of that boundary. He reminded us that it's through keeping a distance from those who are outside that we have order inside. Okay? It's through keeping some others outside and keeping a distance from them that we have security and order inside. Why is he saying this? It sounds obvious, 
he was reminding us that for those of us who would like to extend rights beyond our boundaries, he was telling us, we need to be careful. It's by way of not extending the same rights to outsiders that we have peace and security at home. If you want to extend those rights, citizenship beyond boundaries, I think Andrew Leaklater's work was rather new at the time and he was arguing against these kinds of studies, not in, on normative terms, but in terms of how international relations works. He said, be careful, you need to think this through. This is how IR has worked in history. If you're challenging this, you need to think about what you're going to put in its stead. This is how we have order inside. IR, he said, re rests on the inside outside border, the boundary. So any attempt to extend those boundaries, he reminded us, think about the problems that are likely to be caused by, this, by the removal of this boundary. Boundaries serve a purpose in international relations. That's how IR operates. They produce security for some and insecurity for some others. Now, traditionally, we are told to, th we are told to think that it's those who are inside who are secure and those who are outside who are insecure. This is somewhat misleading and the more recent critical research is actually telling us that every attempt to provide security creates both security and insecurity at the same time. If you look at um, all kinds of boundary practices, you're seeing this. If you look at surveillance practices, for instance, that are becoming more pr prominent in different parts of the world, yeah, we are being watched. There are cameras, not necessarily, not yet everywhere, but that seems to be the direction in which it's moving. Cameras, multiple places, we are being watched. Um, the advances in technology to a certain extent allow for this. A push by the industry, they're producing new technologies, they're pushing for others to buy them. And the climate, the so-called climate of fear in post 9-11 world politics that seems to have led to this widespread adoption of surveillance practices around the world. These are practices of security and insecurity at the same time for the same people, not just insiders versus outsiders. This is usually how the issue is debated, dis discussed in everyday terms. We tend to think that we're producing security for ourselves and insecurity for others. But surveillance practices actually show us that all those kinds of practices provide us with some security, that's us. We're being protected against potential terrorist attacks, we're being told. But they're creating insecurity for us again at the same time in the sense that we're losing some of our privacy. If you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, you may actually be questioned or held under uh, investigation for quite a long time, even if you're pure, perfectly innocent. We're being secured and insecured at the same time in the attempt to feel protected against potential attacks. So insecurity, security beyond borders is, too, um, is not the case any longer. It's not only those who are considered different who are rendered less secure, it's also us, those who are, who we're trying to secure. We're less secure in this world politics because we're becoming less tolerant. That's exactly the issue when it comes to minorities or people who suddenly find themselves in a minority position in the societies in which they did not live like that 10 years ago. We're becoming less tolerant, that's ourselves. We're becoming less accepting, more suspicious of others, and those others may not necessarily felt themselves others 10 years ago. We may have coexisted for a very long time, but borders in our minds are going up and surveillance practices are a part of this. So let me just quickly recap before I move on. International relations is organized around boundaries. There is a particular notion of boundary that's set by the Westphalian system. Although we know that there are other ways of organizing borders and boundaries, we maintain this particular practice because we think it serves a purpose. Yet at the same time, we often don't realize that it's not just about securing us and insecuring them. We are rendering ourselves less secure by way of adopting these kinds of practices. 
we offer security to those inside. We seem to s care less about those who are outside, but we are each creating security and insecurity at the same time for ourselves and for others. So boundaries that we generate for security purposes is generating insecurity for insiders as well as outsiders. That's what the critical perspective tells us. It's very messy. There are no clear-cut lines, although we've attempted to create those lines to just um, secure ourselves. This is our overall approach in international relations. And I br brought in the insights of critical security perspectives. Now, what I'm going to do is to say something about the second half of my title. That's the critical geopolitics perspective. A critical assessment of the geopolitics perspective. That's also referred to as critical geopolitics for those of you who are familiar with the literature. That also starts with Westphalia. That also starts with the state system. When someone says they're offering a critical, uh, sorry, a geopolitical perspective on world politics, we immediately understand that they're going to say something about geography and how geography shapes world politics. That's what geopolitics immediately invokes in our mind. Geo stands for geography, politics stands for politics. Yet at the same time, geopolitics says, I'm saying something that is not political. When someone says they're presenting a geopolitical perspective, they're actually trying to tell us that this is not political. I'm telling you what geography tells us to do. This is the natural perspective. It's above politics. It's not your ideology. It's not my ideology. This is what geography tells us to do. Therefore, you should take this more seriously than your own perspective. Geopolitics immediately takes it up to a different level and says, this is neutral. This is just what geography is telling us to do. We should do this. Not, not because I'm saying this. This is what geography is telling us to do. This is a pr perspective that actually denies its own politics, or it tries to hide its own politics, saying this is only nature that's, nature that's telling us to do. Not this or that politician, but an expert who is who's translating geography for us. An expert in geopolitics translates what geography whispers him or her. So perhaps somewhat confusingly, a geopolitical perspective claims not to be political at all. It's what nat what's nat nature tells us to do. It's not a political choice that we're making. This is what's implied in a geopolitical perspective. You may think that I'm putting it rather crudely, and I'm being perhaps not just to geopoliticians. But if you actually read texts, if you go and read geopoliticians' texts, and I mean the, the, the theoretical geopoliticians in this case, if you go and read these texts, that's what they start with, nature, what nature tells politics to do. Now, before I tell you how critical perspective challenges this, let me just go back in history a bit and tell you that it's, you don't necessarily have to adopt a critical theoretical perspective to be able to challenge this. You can actually adopt a historical perspective and still be able to challenge this link between, apparently direct link between geography and politics. Geopolitical thinking has gone through peer, um, transitions throughout history. If you're interested, um, a political geographer, John Agnew, has written on this. And I'll, I'm just going to summarize what he had to say on the subject. Um, John Agnew calls these tran transitions as the rise and fall of geopolitical discourses, different ways of organizing our thinking and practices about boundaries. First, he says we had civilizational geopolitics, civilizational geopolitics of the 19th century. This discourse of civilizational geopolitics is the one in which different parts of the world are categorized in people's mental maps, borders in our mind, according to the civilization to which they belonged. Civilizations are difficult concepts. There is very little agreement on their definition. Yet when you say civilization, something comes up in the minds of people as to what their civilization is, what the other civilizations is. So these are practices that make sense to people. Civilizations exist in that sense. They exist in discourse, and they exist in our practices. And their boundaries get drawn and redrawn in our, in, through these practices. So civilizational practice is 
ge geopolitics is when we think about geopolitics in terms of civilizations and people's civilizational differences. That's the 19th century. Toward the end of the 19th century, the one that we're more familiar with came about. That's the naturalized geopolitics. Late 19th, early 20th century. That's when geography as a science began to flourish. That's the one that we're very familiar with. It's based on this understanding of geography that politicians were advised. And they were told that if you do this, you'll be successful. If you don't listen, listen to nature, you will be unsuccessful. Now, it rose to prominence in the early 20th century, this perspective. It became very prominent when uh, Nazi Germany was on the rise and was considered particularly successful. Everyone wanted to find out about this naturalized geopolitics perspective because it seemed to work. So you see literatures propping up in different parts of the world at the time. This is the early 1930s. And it fell out of favor immediately after the end of the Second World War because of the very same association. So you don't hear about naturalized geopolitics for about 40 years after that. You hear about it in different parts of the world South America, Spain for a while, Portugal for a while, Turkey for a while, but not necessarily in what we consider to be the West. It only came back in the 19, toward mid, mid 1970s and especially with the end of the Cold War. The Stefano Guzzini book um, that you were mentioning actually was a response to the rise of um, geopolitical perspectives in Europe in the aftermath of um, the Cold War. So there's been a rise until uh, since then, but during most of the Cold War, it was gone in a number of parts of the world. So that's naturalized geopolitics that was gone during the Cold War. What, ha what replaced it during the Cold War is what Agni refers to as ideological geopolitics. You categorize people not according to their ideology, not according to what nature tells you to do, well, sorry, not according to their civilization, not, not according to region, but according to their ideology. Then you have East and West. During this era, um, the categories of East-West shifted meanings. You had a new East, which was not in the Far East, but to the East of Europe. It was a different East, and you, there, there, a different West was constructed which cut across boundaries in different parts of the world. So it became possible for countries to move without actually changing places. The countries re relocated themselves in the west or the east. I use the example of Greece, which seems to be to the east of many countries that were in Eastern Europe, but it was considered to be in the west. Same for Turkey. For ideological relocation purposes, it was considered to be in the west whereas it is to the east of many of the Eastern European so-called countries. So this last one is a controversial one. There is ambivalence on both sides. Nevertheless, the, the, it was possible from an ideological geopolitical perspective for countries to move in our minds, not necessarily physically, but borders were moving in our minds. With the end of the Cold War, ideological geopolitics, it's obvious, Nevertheless, I'll make the point with uh, this discourse of ideological geopolitics has come to an end and left a vacuum. We don't yet know what replaced it. In some countries, we have the rise of naturalized geopolitics. In some other countries, we have the rise of civilizational geopolitics. Especially with Huntington, the, hun uh, the civilizational geopolitical perspective was in rise in some countries. But more often than not, what we observe is that there is a struggle between different parts of the population in the same country as regards how to interpret what is going on. The European Union is sometimes criticized for adopting a civilizational geopolitical perspective, and I'll say more about this. But you can see struggles inside the European Union as to the relevance of different kinds of categories in terms of making sense of what is going on as well. So it's, it's too much of a rush to say civilizational geopolitics is making a comeback. Um, yet at the same time, we can see evidence in those directions as well. Okay. Now, the reason, as I said, I wanted to give you a historical perspective on geopolitical discourse is that 
you don't necessarily have to adopt a critical theory perspective to see that this is only one of the alternatives. Yeah, you can be critical by purely adopting a historical perspective to see that there is nothing natural about the relationship between geo and politics in geopolitics. It's just one way of making sense of the relationship between people and their politics. This is one alternative. You don't have to be a critical theorist to say this. Contemporary uh, perspectives on geopolitics tend to present this, this, is, this as a natural and inevitable way of making sense of world politics. It has its attractions. It immediately turns one into an expert and renders his or her perspective more valuable than others which come across or portrayed as presenting their own personal perspectives. It rises the level up for that purpose. That's why it's important to actually render visible the politics of geopolitics for those of us who are trying to argue against that geopolitical perspective, to make visible the politics of geopolitics so that we would be on level ground, so to speak. We, we each have different perspective. No one is more scientific or more natural, more superior to the other one. We just need to argue. Geopolitical perspectives have been political throughout history. Civilizational geopolitics had a politics. It had us versus them. Naturalized geopolitics had a politics. It also drew boundaries. It had us versus them. So whatever this cause becomes paramount, geopolitics is favored by politicians and self-styled geopoliticians because it allows them to speak a language of state action presents itself as ultimately above politics and renders their choices apolitical, so to speak, and more powerful. So we need some kind of either a historical perspective or a critical perspective to be able to see the politics of this and argue against this. In contrast to cl cl classical perspectives, then a critical perspective allows you to do this. Whereas the classical perspective emphasizes the geo and telling us that this is geography that's telling us to do. The critical perspective emphasizes the politics and reminds us that there is politics in this. It's not geography telling us what to do. It's us deciding what to do with our geography. It highlights the political work, the politics that is doing the work in geopolitics. Now, if you're interested in this perspective, if you're not already familiar with this, there's a wealth of literature on different parts of the world as well. Um, I already mentioned John Agnew's work, the political geographer. If you're interested in, for instance, continents and how continents came about, continents seem obvious that they just stand there. But if you're interested in the construction of continents, there's an excellent book by, called The Myth of Continents by um, Karen Wigan and Martin Lewis. Wigan and Lewis. If you Google The Myth of Con Continents, this is what comes up. It's an excellent book that I read when I was just beginning my PhD research. And my own research is on the construction, own PhD research was on the construction of regions and the making of regions for security purposes. There is a book called The Territorial Trap by um, John Agnew and Stuart Carbridge. It's the Territorial Trap refers to how thinking about states to think about international relations restricts us and does not necessarily allow us to see the complexity of world politics. It's Agnew and Corbridge, the territorial trap. And if you are interested in different geopolitical traditions, Russia, um, Eastern Europe, Latin America, you can look at the works of um, Gerard Otwal. That's a difficult name. I can um, write it down for you, Gerard Otwal, um, based in the United States. Joe Sharp, she's based in the UK. John O'Loughlin, again, based in the United States and uh, class notes based in the UK. So there is a rich literature if you're interested in a critical geopolitical perspective. And I can give you more references if you're interested. So let me just, again, um, recap what, what I've said. I offered a historical overview of geopolitical perspectives. I wanted to emphasize that there is not a single geopolitical perspective. Geopoliticians don't want us to know that. There are multiple perspectives. There is a politics to all this. This is something that we learn from critical geopolitical literature, but this is, as I said, something that we learn from history as well, when we trace the trajectory of geopolitical discourses. I'm going to make this more concrete now. 
and tell you um, the case of the Mediterranean and European Union relations to, uh, to exactly show how adopting a critical perspective allows us to see how boundaries move along with our practices, uh, things that we do to secure ourselves. They change our pra definitions of who we are and who they are, who we are versus who they are. Um, if you're interested in this uh, from a security, critical security perspective, Bill McSweeney's work is particularly interesting. Uh, he looked at the relationship between security, identity, and interests, the cases of Northern Ireland, that's a difficult case, also European unification, another once very difficult, nowadays getting increasingly difficult um, case. So boundary between Europe and the Mediterranean. Now the Mediterranean is high on the agenda nowadays because of immigrants, people on boats trying to cross the Mediterranean. We're increasingly following the events about the protection of boundaries, but the boundaries are being protected not only through the, uh, stopping the people trying to cross the Mediterranean Sea, but we're also protecting those boundaries at home in terms of our relationship with minorities or people who are second, third generation immigrants. Minor boundaries vis-a-vis -vis the Mediterranean is being protected out there, the sea, and also in here in the countries that we live in. The C dimension is about border surveillance, but the second one, when it happens in here in our own countries, this is about mostly about borders in our minds. People who, used to, who we used to think belonged in this country, or perhaps we did not necessarily think too much about them, or people who actually thought that they belonged are finding themselves on the margins of politics at home borders in our minds going up. The boundary between Europe and the Mediterranean seems to be firming up. What is important for us to know is that to go beyond immediate discussions and to go back in history and remind ourselves that this has not always been the case. The border between Europe and the Mediterranean, which is sometimes discussed in everyday debates, in civilizational terms, that's us versus them, very different. We can never get along because this has been the case for centuries and centuries, discussed in civilizational terms. It has not always been the case. If you go back in history, and sometimes going back to the ancient times is not helpful, but it's very helpful in this case. If you look at the first definition of um, the Mediterranean, All Mediterranean people around the Mediterranean Sea were considered to be the definition in ancient Greece. What you then see is that West referred to the Mediterranean at the time. If you were from the West, that meant you were Mediterranean. You were living either to the north or to the south of the Mediterranean. That's another definition of the West for you, a pre, um, a, a, an ancient Greek one. At the time, the east was to the east of the Mediterranean and to the south of the shores of the Mediterranean. That's a different east-west divide for you. Um, it's following the Muslim conquest of parts of the territories to the south of the Mediterranean and the gradual emergence of the idea of Europe that Europe moves southwards, so does the Mediterranean. It moves. So people who used to belong to the West now became the East. The solidification of the idea of Europe takes place and through the politics of civilizational discourses, Europe as a continent comes up in our minds. The discovery, is Amer the so-called discovery of America is important, I will not go there. What's important to take from this is that in terms of the divide between Europe and the Mediterranean, there was a lot of fluidity in ancient times. There was a lot of fluidity in the 20th century as well, if you think ancient times is a bit too ancient. There was a lot of fluidity in the 20th century as well. If you get the European, if you go back to the European community's own relationship with the Mediterranean and how North African peoples looked at Europe, in the 20th century, first half of this 20th century, you see that there's a lot of fluidity. 
in terms of the North African countries, there isn't that much of a clear-cut dividing line between who's Mediterranean and who's Arab. Even President Nasser, which, who was the president of Egypt, he was talking about an Egyptian identity, an Arab identity, and a Mediterranean identity at the time. You get Tunisian intellectuals talking about the Mediterranean identity at the time. Yeah? There was no clear-cut dividing line between who was Arab, who was not, who was Mediterranean, who was not at the time. So our contemporary debate, it's important to remind ourselves that our contemporary debates are really very contemporary. Everyone who makes a reference to ancient hatreds, ancient differences, ancient dividing lines are constructing them in one sense as they go along. There is a politics to the civilizational geopolitics discourse. So as countries picked up one dimension of their identity to um, play against the other, the Arab identity solidified, the European identity solidified, and the Mediterranean identity for a while seemed to um, be pushed to the background. It comes to the foreground in the 1990s, 1990s, 25 years, not longer than that, thanks to the European Union again. The Barcelona process in the 1990s, the treaty itself, 1995, it's the European Union that actually brings up its own Europe, uh, Mediterranean identity and wants to create a Mediterranean security zone so that these borders that are on, on our minds are played differently so that there will be more security around the Mediterranean. What, is, what was worrying for the European Union at the time was the oil shock, the need for better relations with uh, some of the Arab countries, but more significantly, if you look at the, um, the debates that were going on at the time, more significantly, the problem of immigration and the need to have better relations with the south of the Mediterranean so that there will be less Im reason for immigration. The European Union's own outlook toward the Mediterranean as a security project was very different during the 1990s compared to now. That's 25 years, 30 years of history that we are talking about. The European Union changed, its, changed the borders in our minds in less than 30 years. What happened is that during the 1990s, it was decided at the EU level that economic, political, um, diplomatic engagement with the Mediterranean counterparts would be better. It would be better than Cold War style politics. They adopted a broader conception of security which we refer to in the literature as the EU practice, yeah, turning political issues into technical issues so that they, it will be easier to address, address them. So that's the logic of the European project itself. Though it's very easy to forget about this, think, forget about the fact that the European Union itself was a peace project, a security project, trying to bring peace to the continent in the aftermath of the security um, uh, the Second Cold World War and its destruction. When we are discussing the potential for a British exit from the European Union, it's easy to forget what the European Union in the beginning was about. It was a peace project, and 1995, the Mediterranean, Euro-Mediterranean partnership was about trying to export this peace project to the Medi shores of the Mediterranean so that the problem of immigration would be dealt with in a different kind of way. It's easy to forget this because at some point the European Union moved away from this practice. It was thought that it did not work. Um, it was first moved, it, there was a Euro-Mediterranean Union proposal and recently became uh, the neighborhood policy, which means that it, there was a halt that came to the project of exporting the EU's own pro, um, peace project and became more of a containment kind of practice. So what is happening is that the European Union itself is moving away from its own project, on differentiated approach to security, and drawing up boundaries. Now, the Mediterranean countries were already aware of this. It does not necessarily come as a surprise to them. Still not working? 
we need a moving microphone or I need to stay still. Okay? Okay. Um, what is happening is not necessarily new to Mediterranean countries. In the sense that during the 1990s, or even the earlier than that, they were already aware of what was going on. They were aware of this in the sense that in the immediate aftermath of the coming down of the wall, 1989, the discussions that in Europe were shaped around the, fo the former Eastern Bloc countries coming home. That's a boundary, isn't it? If you're coming home, you already belong, and you're coming home. That's an invisible boundary. When Morocco applied for membership, who remembers? 1980s. Yeah, it was told, no. It was not even considered. With Turkey, it was considered, it's still in a different kind of process, but clearly there are some invisible borders as to who belongs, who has a potential to belong, who naturally belongs. There are invisible borders there. Invisible borders were already obvious to many of us. Yeah, not just visible, but invisible borders were already obvious to many of us. What happened in the last 10 years or so is that these are becoming even more obvious through surveillance practices, through the European Union adopting increasingly militarized and policing practices in the attempt to deal with the issue of immigration, which is the final thing that I'm going to talk about. I will not go into the case of um, the Turkish membership, partly because that's not my specialty, and partly because it does not come central to this, it's more about EU Mediterranean relations. What I'm going to talk about finally is a change in an instance of changing borders in our mind through um, the European Union's own politics. This is something that in the literature we refer to as temporalizing difference and spatializing time. That's critical geopolitics language for you. During the age of ideological geopolitics, we knew who belonged to where. There was the Eastern Bloc, there was the Western Bloc. Yeah? and the rest perhaps belong to try to con uh, present themselves as the non-aligned bloc, the third world, it became south more recently. Um, it's not just the case of Turkey, but it is one of the more obvious cases in the sense that when the east-west divide became less visible, Turkey suddenly needed to be placed somewhere and became difficult, yeah. If you look, adopt a critical geopolitics perspective, things that we take for granted become less uh, natural, come across as less natural. Yet politicians keep talking about things as if they're natural and borders keep coming, going up. Um, let me make this very concrete because it has concrete consequences. The way in which this very abstract thing has concrete consequences. Now, in the way in which we talk about other people who are different, we put them back in history. That's what is called temporalizing people who are different. People who are different from us, we put them back in the history in the sense that they become developing world. They're back in history, the developing world. They're a couple of steps behind us. They're going to come here, hopefully, but they're a couple of steps behind us. The third world, the developing world, failed states, state failure, they've attempted, not yet successful, yeah? These are all temporalizing difference. People who are different from us, we push, back, push them back in history. There's a progressive element in that we are expecting them to grow up and become more like us, but nevertheless, we put a temporal difference between us and them, the developing world, the third world states. Adequate statehood, it's not there yet, but there's hope. This temporalizes difference. We, other people, we put them back in history. What we then do is what we call spatializing time. Those people who we decided were back in history, they were not there yet, but they're coming. We then assign them particular geographies in the world. 
yeah? Then the third world becomes a part of the world. It's not just a border in our mind. It becomes the South. It becomes Africa. It becomes parts of Asia. It becomes perhaps parts of South America, etc. Depending on which pa ca part of the world you're more familiar with, sometimes it becomes parts of countries. Yeah? There's a South in the North, there's a North in the South kind of discussion. So temporalizing difference attach, uh, assigns a different time zone to those people who we think are different from us. They're not there yet. They're not as successful as us, but they, hopefully they'll come there. And we then assign them a geography saying that, well, these are the people who are in the developing world, they live there. Zones of conflict, zones of peace, if you're familiar with that, those de de debates, these all rest on these kinds of assumptions, temporalizing difference, spatializing time, drawing borders in our mind with very physical, visible consequences. We're putting, pushing people back in time and we assume that their security dynamics work differently. There's a different human rights regime there. They may not be as sensitive. We may be able to export different security surveillance practices there. We may be able to export different security practices, things that we don't do at home, we may be able to do there. Rendering. Export of border surveillance. This is how some EU countries, not the European Union itself, some EU countries interacted with some North African states throughout the early years of the 21st century. Exporting of militarized policing practices, close collaboration with some of the regimes. Some of those regimes are long gone now, but close collaboration with them. Turning a blind eye to their human rights violations. Resting on these kinds of assumptions. They belong to a different time. There are different dynamics that are, work, that are at work there. There are, it is possible to adopt different kinds of practices there because of this term, temporalization of difference, spatialization of time. Those beyond these new borders that are in our mind are rendered insecure as a result of this. And I'll conclude on this one. It allows us to portray their insecurities as a passing phase. They're insecure, their regimes are insecure, but it's going to go away. But in the meantime, let's cooperate with them and let's export certain technologies so that their problems don't become our problems. If, it, if there's a passing phase in search for security, and if they're not necessarily uh, using the standards that we use here, we're also, we're not only exporting militarized policing practices, but we're also outruling different alternative solutions. A different alternative solution is in the past of the European Union itself. That was the Mid Euro Mediterranean perspective, which was pushed aside for this more militarized policing kind of perspective. So mili military policing practices now are presented to us as the only alternative for dealing with the issue of immigration, the dealing with the issue of um, asylum seekers, immigrants arriving from the Mediterranean. Let me just um, um, emphasize something here. It's, just not, it's not just the northern actors that are to blame here. I mentioned um, the European Union a lot, but keep in mind that someone was cooperating with them. There was a north-south cooperation in this regard. Some Mediterranean regimes were increasingly becoming enforcers of European security policies at home against their own citizens or sometimes immigrants from w who were arriving from further south. So there, is there was cooperation going on across the Mediterranean against the human rights of people. The global war on terror helped in this regard. 
It allowed regimes to pursue their own regime security against the ex at the expense of their own citizens. So this constituted a break not only for um, people themselves, but for the EU itself. Not only in terms of temporalization of difference, because the South has always been different. It was expected to, be grow, to grow up, remember, in the Euro-Mediterranean perspective as well. Whereas in this case, there is more violence involved, there is more policing involved, there is more securitized practices involved. From the ENP, that's the Euro-Mediterranean Partnership, to ENP, European no e Neighborhood Policy, there are two ways in which we are actually um, doing more or less the same. In the past, reform was security policy. The past, the South still belonged to the past, but we were in the North. The North was teaching them to be, so that they will grow up and become more like them. Whereas here, there is no more teaching involved. There is still a hierarchical relationship, but less teaching involved. This is more about security cooperation and sometimes cooperation with countries with worrisome human rights record. So there is a change, there is some continuity, but there is also some change involved in there as well. Um, over the years then what we observe is more technologized practices being involved, more violent measures being involved, and more boundaries that are being drawn up in our minds with technological consequences and insecurity consequences for people. It's not just southern citizens, people who are on transit who are also affected as a result of this. Um, I can say more about the Arab Spring. We, have a, we had a project that looked at the particular dynamics before the Arab Spring. I can come back to this um, if you're interested in this. Uh, what I want to conclude on is that this issue of internal, external security is, until recently, the discussion was that internal and external divide is evaporating. If you look at um, Didier Bigot's work, for instance, he was reminding us that increasingly we are protecting our external security at home, the police, is taking up external security roles, and internal security is being protected at the border or sometimes in the neighboring countries. There was a blurring, he was telling us, of internal and external securities throughout Europe. Internal security is increasingly sought outside boundaries, and external security increasingly pursued at home through surveillance, data mining, etc. All kinds of things that um, Edward Snowden was revealing in the United States and parts of Europe as well, if you've been following the discussions. So he was telling us that in internal and external is becoming increasingly difficult to distinguish, yet at the same time, those of us who were following the debate, say in France or in the UK, or you may bring other examples that you're more familiar with, some of us have been observing that there is, there are other internal external devices that are going up. There are these devices that are going up as a result of temporalizing of difference. Some people are pushed back in history. They're being relegated to the past. They're considered different and they belong to the past. And spatializing of time, those parts of the country, those parts of the city, those parts of the continent who actually belong to a different time. I focused on the Mediterranean, but these borders in our minds can be observed in our hometowns, in the treatment of new members of the European Union. I used the example of a border um, official or you may actually say in the treatment of Greece nowadays, who finds itself on the border of Europe in terms of the treatment of some other EU members of states. Or you can find this in the treatment of second, third generation immigrants who were born in those countries, but who suddenly see borders coming up in the countries, in the invisible borders coming up in the countries that they have actually been born in and have lived all their lives. Hence my emphasis on the vi invisible aspect of boundaries as opposed to the visible aspects of boundaries. I'll finish here, I'll, I'll take questions if you have them, and hopefully comments and reactions as well. Thank you. <laughs>